Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar. Today we are honored to have special guest host Dr. Anna Belfina, the Assistant Professor, Department of Pathology from the Boston University School of Medicine. She's also the Associate Director of the Flow Cytometry Core Facility. In addition, Dr. Belkina is an ISAC SRL Emerging Leader for 2015 through 2019. I'd like to introduce our Senior Application Scientist, Chen Jin Zhang. She'll be hosting the webinar today. Take it away, Chen Jin. Hi, thank you, Liz. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar today. Uh, this is Chen Jin Zhang. We are honored to have uh, Dr. Anna Belkina with us. Um, I'd like to say that Anna and I both share deep roots within Isaac. As uh, Liz just said, she's um, very active within the society and she's a SR emerging leader there. Her last webinar with Cytobank featured Visme was very popular. We had record high attendees uh, a few years ago. You may go to Cytobank YouTube channel to watch the recording there if you haven't already. For today, I'll give an overview of Cytobank, introducing some of the tools available to help visualize and analyze high dimensional cytometry data with a focus on citrus. Dr. Bekina will then share her research on how she used citrus to identify stratifying features that differentiate HIV positive and Asian cohort versus uninfected controls. It will be followed by live Q&A. Uh, you may submit your questions anytime during the talk in the Q&A window. For those who are not familiar with Cytobank, uh, it's a cloud-based single cell analysis platform uh, for high dimensional data. As nowadays, with the advancement of technology, we are able to measure many parameters simultaneously on a single cell level. You can do 10, 20, uh, 50, or even more uh, with some of the genomic techniques like SiteSeq or RNA-seq. So also the number of samples uh, increase dramatically, especially in the context of clinical trial, where different patient cohort, different treatment and time points are measured. So the whole field is going toward high dimensional and high throughput. This imposes huge challenge on data management, data analysis and visualization. Also, the data reproducibility with cytometry data is also a concern. We all know there's quite a bit of expert uh, variability associated with manual gating. So people seek help from computational algorithms, which are very compute intensive and require scalable computing power. Um, also with big data, transfer and share the data among collaborators globally becomes a challenge too. So Cytobank comes in with the cloud-based solution to specialize in um, high dimensional data so that we can uh, leverage cloud computing power for many of the algorithm we have inside the bank. We also offer structured content management where you can securely save and archive your analysis. You can collaborate and share easily with the colleagues too uh, just by a share button. So the platform is designed for biologists uh, no coding is required to run any of those algorithms. You can also make Cytobank's professional bioinformatic consulting team as a part of your team for your research project. And we welcome any potential collaborations in that regard. Uh, here's a list of the machine learning algorithm available in Cytobank. We have clustering tools like Spade and Flowsum. Flowsum is one of our new release that enables you to cluster more events in shorter time. Uh, Visni, you may all be familiar with, it's the dimension reduction tool allows you to map uh, n-dimensional events onto 2D plot and still preserving the, all the information of all events. Um, Citrus is our focus today. It's a powerful statistical tool to uh, differentiate the differences between your sample groups. Uh, it's probably one of our most complicated tools. Uh, we'll be back to that in more details in later slides. Before we jump to uh, Citrus, I'd like to introduce some of the key functionalities in Cytobank. We have a whole suite of data analysis tool 
uh, we see data analysis as a uh, pipeline workflow. The first step will be data pre-processing, which includes you know, compensation, scale transformation, and pre-gating to get a clean quality data for downstream analysis. Uh, after that, you can either use clustering tools or dimension reduction tools like Visni, Frosom, Spade, and Citrus. As we said earlier, you can leverage the cloud computing power to run multiple analysis simultaneously and free up your local computer that way. Uh, there are a few other features in Citibank that allows you to extend the functionality further. Uh, job is the feature allows you to convert non-cytometry data to FCS format, so then you can analyze them with all the tools available here. Or you can run command line with Cytobank API, the application programming interface, to interact with the data stored in Cytobank. So normally, user access the data use web browser uh, for Cytobank. You can gate your samples, you can run a Visni run request to the cloud within your browser. Uh, but the API really extends the functionality where you can send you know, batched instructions to batch upload, download data um, to Cytobank. You can also uh, use uh, this interface to communicate with um, the electronic lab notebook or LIM system. Uh, so the communication uh, transfer and data information between those systems become an automated process. Or you can even use customize the code to build a pipeline to run algorithm that's otherwise not available within Cytobank. Then you can upload the results of the data back to Cytobank. Um, so the API allows easy collaboration between bioinformatician statisticians and biologists. Cytobank can serve as the central platform connecting all those workflows. Here, as we said earlier, job, you can convert any tabular data into FCS format. It can be a CSV file or text file. Uh, you can upload that file normally uh, into the upload uh, data interface within Cytobank. Uh, you may choose the column and rows to be included in the data. Then the job will convert that file into a FCS format. So once it is converted to FCS, you can use all those tools that's available you know, for your uh, on site seek data or your imaging data and uh, some of the other uh, single cell genomic data. Here's an example showing uh, what the site seek data looks like in uh, Cytobank. With some filtering and normalization, the uh, events looks quite similar to conventional cytometry data uh, in this 2D plot. Uh, you can also visualize the data with the Visni algorithms as well. Uh, we just had a webinar last month with Dr. Deep Ramon. Uh, he featured his SightSeq analysis workflow within Cytobank. You may uh, check it out with our YouTube channel. Uh, so finally, back to Citrus. Uh, so what is Citrus? Uh, Citrus stands for you know, Cluster Identification, Characterization, and Regression, as a names. It has several components associated with it. Uh, first step will be unsupervised hierarchical clustering to identify the phenotypically similar cells in all samples. Then uh, it will uh, go to uh, characterization of those clusters by either abundance of subsets or median expression markers like activation marker or phosphoprotein markers. And then statistical models are used to identify the stratifying biomarker that can be used to tell the differences between groups, such as is a very automated process where all the process here is within the black box. You start with your scientific question and end with stratifying biomarkers. So put it in a simple way, basically it is used to identify significant differences that can differentiate groups. Such as can help you to perform unbiased and potentially more thorough data mining and inspection of cell subsets within your data. These statistical models with Citrus can be correlative or predictive. Correlative model can be used to identify 
all the significant differences in cell populations between sample group. And there are two predictive models, PAM or LESO. We'll talk about those models next. Here's another slide showing you know what, which model should you choose once you're running uh, Citrus. Uh, it depends on real, as we said, depend on your questions. If you are trying to identify all the significant differences uh, between your groups, we may uh, run SAM, the correlative Citrus, or uh, if the question is to identify the minimum number of features that are necessary to predict the endpoints, like which sample belongs to which group, uh, you may run uh, the predictive model. An example of that will be, um, you know, cancer patient treated with immunotherapy, um, where if we are trying to uh, identify all the differences between the responders and non-responders, you may run some. Or if you are trying to identify, you know, what is the minimum number of uh, biomarker or cell subsets that can uh, tell the difference, tell, you know, which sample belong to the responder group or non-responder group, we can use the predictive model. And there are two models associated with the predictive uh, stages. One is a PAM and one is LASO. There are a few differences between them. LASO can only run with two groups and there's no false discovery rate associated with this model. If you are running with more than two groups and uh, false discovery rate is designed, you, then you should run PAM. So in Anna's talk later, she used both models. Uh, predictive model was used to identify the minimum number of features necessary to predict those HIV positive and non-infected controls. Correlative model was used to identify, you know, all the clusters that are significant different between those two groups regard to uh, differential inhibitory and receptor expression. Uh, you'll hear more from her uh, in a moment. So we mentioned earlier that is a cluster characterization process involved. After you decide on which model to run with Citrus, you now can choose, you know, which feature you would like to run. The features include um, either median expression of markers in your panel or abundance of certain subsets. You can choose one or another with one citrus run, but you can set up two citrus runs to check on both. Again, when to use what is also depend on your study. If you are hypothesizing that there are biomarker expression level change with your patients receiving cancer uh, therapy, such as you know, immune checkpoints, PD-1 expression level within your responder and non-responder, you may choose uh, the median. Or if you are looking at change of frequency of certain cell type, like Tregs with different disease status, you know, like uh, some patients are recovering after the treatment, some patients are still progressing with the disease. So you may use abundance for identify the frequency of subsets or clusters. Uh, here's an example showing, you know, the setup of uh, stitches. First of all, you need to have at least two groups to start with. Uh, assign your samples to a different group based on uh, different outcome or different endpoints, like responders or non-responders. Then you run searches to identify clusters of phenotypic similar cells in all sample. And once the clusters identify, it will start to characterize the biological features of those clusters on a per sample base. Citrus then use either you know, correlative or predictive model to identify the uh, subset feature that best predict the endpoints or use correlative model to identify all the differences between uh, two groups. So here is a cluster, uh, this class, particular cluster discovered with differential phosphor as six signal in this particular cluster. And uh, between those uh, group A responder group and a non-responder group, uh, we can then use to identify this cluster further after uh, run stitches. Um, here's a stitches tree looks like. Uh, this stitches tree, um, you know, starts with a center cluster uh, that contained all events from all samples. Then it branched out uh, with child and a grandchild clusters. And each parent cluster contained the events of 
its children. And there, you probably couldn't see, but there are arrows between the cluster pointing from parents to child. If the connected clusters are identified as significant, as highlighted here, you probably can just pick the parent cluster as it means all the child cluster here, unless you know you want to identify the subsets in more details. Uh, so in this case, you know, a cluster uh, was identified as a differences in the abundance with those two groups. And then you can uh, check on the marker expression on this per particular cluster to identify the phenotype. Um, so uh, other than, you know, you can run Citrus by itself. Uh, you can also incorporate Citrus into a data analysis pipeline with other um, algorithm like VISNI. Uh, so in this workflow, you can run VISNI first, and then you run Citrus on your VISNI uh, data so that you know, your Citrus results will have this TISNI1 and TISNI2 channel where uh, you can now overlay your Citrus cluster back to VISNI to identify you know, what's the fin type and what they look like on the VISNI map. I'll show you an example here uh, where Citrus was run to identify the, the median expression of this phospho as six expression in the control and the BCR stimulated uh, samples, uh, then you will see, you know, once this cluster is identified, you're able to, um, this is the VISNI map of the same data. Uh, you can able to overlay that cluster back to your VISNI map. And once it's on the visiting map, you're able to you know, highlight with the third channel to check on the expression marker of um, you know, some of the uh, lineage marker like CD20. You'll see they are mostly significant cluster is belong to uh, B cells. And also you may also turn on the phospho S6, which is not showing here to see the expression level of that particular cluster. So here I just showed you options where you can, you know, how you can use Citrus and uh, and if I, and uh, the some of the data visualization and interpretation tools uh, within Cytobank. Uh, if you have any question, I'll be happy to take it during the Q and A session. But um, without overdue, I'd like to. Uh, turn the screen for Dr. Belkina's talk, you will see, you know, how Citrus was applied to her study and making unexpected discovery in the HIV and aging cohort. Anna, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining. Thanks, Chen Jun, for your introduction and overview. So I'll just jump into the story, uh, just not to lose time. So, um, our team has broad interest in how the functional activity of immune cell populations is altered in chronic diseases. And specifically, we're interested in cells that bridge innate and adaptive immunity, which include natural killer cells, uh, natural killer T cells, another new T cell population called the gamma delta T cell. So when the immune response begins, the microbe or tumor antigens are infected or taken up by the cells in the microenvironment, such as an immune cell, uh, innate immune cell depicted there. Uh, it can be a dendritic cell or a macrophage. So the cell will then respond to the new antigen or infection by changing the MHC expression, and uh, we, that will activate NK cells. Also by se secreting some inflammatory cytokines, which would activate NK cells as well as NKT and gamma delta T cells. So the cells then secrete more cytokines, uh, and either inflammatory or immunosuppressive, and they can also become cytotoxic. So the thinking is that the effector functions of the cells then dictate the nature of the memory T and B responses, and the cells are likely very important in the um, chronic disease, but overall they're understudied in comparison with traditional T cells and B cells. And conversely, the function of these cells is prone to, be, to the phenomenon of, of exhaustion. So what is immune exhaustion? Exhaustion occurs when specific antigens, such as from a pathogen or tumor, and or non-specific inflammatory factors are sustained in a host well past the acute phase of the response. So exhausted cells are believed to progressively lose of ex vivo functional capacity over time, and also upregulate so-called inhibitor receptors. And this process has gained a lot of interest in recent years, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that because due to groundbreaking clinical trial results using therapeutics that block the inhibitor receptor 
signaling, such as PD-1, PD-L1 access, for example. So here is uh, an example from a melanoma study where a patient was on uh, anti-PD-1 clinical trial and it shows complete eradication of the tumor 90 days after the initiation of the treatment. So this result suggests the reversibility of the exhaustion state, and this reversibility has been shown in animal models as well. And one view of how immune exhaustion progresses is that an individual cell will upregulate more and more inhibitor receptors over time, and this will be linked to the loss of effector function capabilities. However, evidence from our group and others indicate that this process likely occurs in a complex branched manner with factors in the microenvironment driving distinct immune cell substance into a variety of inhibited states. So we hypothesize that the states may be reflected through the individual inhibitor receptor signatures on immune cells. And we predict that inhibitor receptor signatures can provide new insight into how checkpoint inhibition progresses and how it can be broken into stages, what certain functions are lost, and how also would help us to determine at what point we cannot rescue a cell from immune exhaustion uh, because it's no longer reversible. So back in 2017, we designed a 16-color flow cytometry panel that would allow to identify multiple lineages of immune cells and characterize their inhibitor receptor signatures all in one panel. So this panel was specifically optimized for our 16-color Faxari sorter to allow simultaneous sorting of multiple populations of interest. So we worked out several combinations of inhibitor receptors that would be relevant to the disease of interest and all these panel variations would share the same panel backbone that allows to distinguish uh, the major immune subsets. Uh, we applied this panel to a good half dozen studies by now, I think. And uh, today we will be talking about our work with the immune exhaustion signatures in our HIV and aging cohort. So uh, the question that we asked in the study was, is immune exhaustion of particular immune subsets linked to HIV and or age-induced so-called inflammation. So to answer this question, we teamed up with Dr. Nina Lin, an assistant professor of medicine in our school, who has been working with this cohort for many years. So just to set up a backdrop for the story, people living with HIV have seen great improvements in both the length and quality of their lives in the last several decades, or at least last decade, since antiretroviral therapy now works very well at lowering and keeping viral loads below the limit of detection. However, even without detectable viral loads, HIV is still significantly detrimental to one's health. And such individuals are at increased risk for what is called serious non-AIDS events, or SNAs, which include cardiovascular disease, neurological problems, diabetes, cancer, osteoporosis, liver cirrhosis, frailty, pneumonia, and some others. So interestingly, these diseases are typically associated with aging as well. So there are reports of higher rates of these comorbidities in HIV positive subjects compared with the general population at the same age. And there are some reports that these events occur in younger ages in HIV positive people compared to uninfected controls. So this is the concept of inflammation, that the very low levels of the virus that remain are causing inflammation that is somehow aging the person to develop this age-associated illnesses. And there's a debate in the literature as to whether HIV-positive persons are aging earlier or differently. And a key point to keep in mind is that it's not clear if these conditions in HIV patients manifest due to similar processes as what occur in normal aging or via completely distant, di distinct mechanisms. What is well established in the field is that the occurrence of these non-AIDS events is strongly associated with plasma markers of general inflammation, including CRP, L6, soluble TNF receptor 1 and 2, soluble CD14, as well as some coagulation markers like D-dimer and fibrinogen. There was a study that followed HIV-positive patients over time, and it found that higher levels of these biomarkers before the occurrence of a serious non-AIDS events are present. And also the same plasma markers track with disease onset in non-HIV aging as well. So our questions were, first of all, is the inhibitor receptor expression of a particular immune substance different with aging, HIV infection, or both? Does HIV infection and older age impact our immune measurements in an additive or a synergistic manner? Or do people with HIV simply immune age earlier than the general population? And finally, does expression of inhibitor receptors, or they called also immune checkpoints, always track with the loss of functional activity of immune cells. That's the definition of immune exhaustion. So 
the cohort that we use called the HIV and aging cohort was established by Dr. Nina Lin. And uh, that cohort includes the four groups comprised of healthy young, healthy older, HIV younger, and HIV older subjects. We have over uh, 20 subjects per group for most of our analysis. And the subjects were matched for sex and ethnicity. And also it's important to mention that the HIV negative subjects in the cohort have similar lifestyle and socioeconomic exposures as the infected subjects. So all the HIV positive subjects in the study have sustained viral load for a minimum of one year. And uh, we collected PBMC and plasma for these patients and uh, non-inspected subjects. And we stained them with inhibitor receptor signature panel, uh, collected fluorescent cytometry data. Also, we sorted multiple cell types from the study. And we had several biologically plausible hypotheses to test. And we wanted to use some unbiased analysis to go through those hypotheses and actually mine for new hypotheses. And here we go to citrus. So we fed all our flow cytometry data to citrus. And Chen Jun has already walked you through the general outline, so I'll just focus on the specifics of the study. Uh, so you know what a citrus is, that algorithm designed for a full admit discovery of statistically significant stratifying biological signatures uh, in single cell data sets. So in our case, flow cytometry data. So uh, we would associate the phenotype with some endpoint. In our case, this would be the subject group. And uh, we carried all our citrus analysis inside a bank. So assigned our subjects to groups per their HIV status. We also ran some four-way comparisons. And also we tested if we can use age alone for subject classification. And uh, we identified lineage parameters for clustering that are like a logical conclusion out of the panel design that we implied. So uh, citrus is based on hierarchical clustering, as you've heard. Uh, would randomly select an equal number of cells from each sample, combine them, and cluster all at once. So what's interesting here is that all clusters in this tree would be considered for analysis, not just the peripheral smallest clusters, right? And uh, that way, Citrus would avoid the problem of calculating how many populations exist in this database. And that's kind of one of the main problems with most clustering algorithms. Uh, so the tree that you see here has a lot of redundancy because the same cell is included in multiple uh, parent-child clusters. And you can expect that clusters that contain some cells will correlate with the same endpoint. But citrus algorithm modeling actually corrects for correlating features, uh, and that is not a problem to calculate significance of your results. Uh, so we use modeling approaches that are built into citrus um, pipeline and to find statistically different signatures in our cohorts. And is, you know that Citrus can assess the proportion of sample cells in each cluster and also the median level of each functional marker in a cluster of cells. So there can be several scenarios here. Scenario A would be that the cluster size based on lineage marker is significantly different between the groups. So for example, group A has higher percentage of CD4 cells than group B. The other scenario would be that non-lineage markers um, are differenti differentially expressed between the groups. So for example, group A has more PD1 on the CD4 cells than group B. So uh, we considered both scenarios in our analysis. And before I go show you our results, I'd like to discuss our workflow. Uh, so we take our raw flow cytometry data, fluorescent data, and we apply compensation either on acquisition or using a post-analysis compensation platform. Mostly we use uh, compensation on acquisition because we also sort the cells. So we do some quality assessment using both some automated tools and expert guided analysis. And then we usually transfer at this point data transferred to Cytobank. Um, so that line indicates Cytobank decision. Um, and then we verify the correct data transformation, uh, which is you, what you, you find under the scale setting in Cytobank. So uh, we usually use ArcSign transformation for all our fl fluorescent cytometry data. Uh, and usually the automated parameter selection works pretty well for us, but sometimes one or two channels are they need adjustment. So it's really important for pretty much any platform that you use inside of Inc that you verify your scaling. And with flow cytometry data, sometimes scaling can be quite different between channels. So it needs to be controlled for. So then uh, we identify subsets for citrus analysis. So uh, in the default way, we would just use all our live lymphocyte cells for citrus. So you know that minimum cluster size in citrus is defined by user. 
And setting this parameter to small number will allow smaller, more rare cell subsets to cluster cleanly. But that will also reduce statistical power to detect associations. So if you know that your data set contains both large but roughly uniform populations and small populations, it may be tricky to get one run of citrus to compare all subsets. So if your minimum cluster size is large, you risk missing smaller populations. And if it is small, you risk having not enough statistical power. And in that case, also citrus will attempt to break your large populations into smaller but biologically meaningless clusters. So in our case, we had actually to subsample the smallest populations, which are INKT cells, and they're under 0.1%. Uh, so we subset them out and ran them separately to reach statistical, uh, to re reach sufficient granularity in our analysis. So that approach would introduce some bias to the study, and that's unavoidable, unfortunately. But um, we, we, we can't cover everything with one parameter selection, right? So, and it, as always with any modeling, we try to verify our citrus results with alternative approaches. So we don't take it from citrus straight into submit to nature button, right? So um, citrus offers several modeling approaches, and they were outlined by Qin Zheng, and this slide is more like a placeholder for those who would be watching this later for studying. And I also highly recommend a webinar by Cytobank Senior Application Scientist Geoff Cracker. Um, on, it's uh, on YouTube channel by Cytobank. So that one covers the modeling in very much details. So in our hands, we found the PAM uh, prediction analysis for microarray uh, modeling the most helpful. And also these results agree best with other statistical analysis that we perform outside of the Citrus pipeline. There's another predictive model lasso. Um, and uh, in our hands, we see that it has a tendency of selecting the smallest clusters as predictors. And since hierarchical clustering in Citrus sometimes is a little bit sloppy, uh, the results often look like we're pulling answers from over clustering or low specificity clusters. So uh, we found the lasso method less useful in this regard. And then also there is SAM, so a significance analysis of microarrays. It's a correlative model. Um, it uh, also has its own niche. Uh, we find that it often seems to be a little bit overexcited with our data. So even if we set the most stringent cutoff for significance, and we would often use this uh, modeling for, as a first pass for analysis, and also for finding possible batch effects and other artifacts in our data. So let me illustrate this. So this is some negative results that you usually don't see in publications. So from a different study. So we compared cohorts uh, that were pretty much identical. And you can see that none of this PAM models do any better job than a random 50-50 guess. So this red line is hanging around 50%. We compared abundances. We compared uh, inhibitor receptor median expression. We tried normalizing the scales or not normalizing the scales. And the result is pretty much the same. Uh, and that's expected. However, when we look at SAM results, SAM actually found several clusters to be significantly different in these two cohorts. And one of them, the CD8 one here, was just a pure artifact of overclustering. Uh, and another one, the CD3 cluster here, was uh, not statistically different when this population was identified by other methods. But the third one identified a population that almost fell under the minimum cluster size limit, and that's why it was not picked up by PAM. So when we lowered the um, limit enough to get that population in, there was so much overclustering that PAM didn't find it significant and interesting enough. So we took this population and actually followed it up with other methods to check if there is a real biological phenomenon behind this result. Uh, so now going back to our HIV study, uh, with real results, uh, we clustered our data with citrus and assessed median expression of all inhibitor receptors. So in this batch of runs, we identified all major subsets of immune cells uh, that we could see with this panel. Uh, so we can see CD8s and K cells, CD4 cells, um, and I don't think I mapped them here, but also uh, Tregs. Uh, the exception was INKT cells. As I said, they're, too, they're distinct but very rare. So citrus couldn't cluster them cleanly. And with PAM modeling, the minimal set of features that distinguished our subsets was that the digit expression solely on gamma delta T cells stratified the HIV positive subjects from non-infected individuals. This result was very robust. We reproduced it multiple times. And uh, so just 
if you're interested in how we set up our, our runs here, we tried normalizing the scales and not normalizing the scales, and uh, we didn't see much difference in, in this specific data set between these two set of sets. Um, now, uh, here is more details about this. This is digit expression uh, in each gamma delta T cell cluster identified by citrus. It's consistently higher in the HIV positive individuals compared with controls. There is also some interesting heterogeneity in the gamma delta population that when we check out other surface markers expressed on this cell, such as CD8, CD16, CD56, CD127. And this is when you may want to subsample just gamma delta T cells from your data set into a separate citrus run to be able to find smaller but biologically meaningful subsets that would be too small for the cutoff of your larger run. Because um, as you can imagine, gamma delta T cells in blood it would be probably less than 5%. So if you're subsetting them further, it's really hard to get clustering done cleanly with the universal cutoff. And um, when we look for FDR constraint model, so this is not a minimal model, uh, not a minimal set of settings, but still significant set of settings. Uh, we find that two other inhibitor receptors, CD160 and TIM3, also differentiate our groups of subjects, but also only from the clusters containing gamma delta T cells. And it is important to note that inhibitor receptors are expressed across all subsets of immune cells in this data set. Finding the difference just in gamma delta T cells, whose role in HIV is totally unclear, and not in CD4s or CD8s, was very surprising for us, okay? And I mean, of course, we, were, we expected that we'll see the CD4, CD8 ratio shift in HIV individuals, which is a hallmark of HIV infection. And that was indeed infected in our, in, reflected in our citrus results. So when we did abundance uh, run, we found that we have change in uh, CD4 and CD8 uh, percentages. And um, just an anecdote, you can see that I have the SAM and uh, the PAM models here. And uh, you can see that SAM actually finds more clusters to be significant. And that goes back to my discussion about uh, why we prefer PAM for more, more um, uh, stringent results. So I don't know if I can say it that way, but um, I would say SAM is definitely putting in things that we not necessarily follow up as significant by other methods. So next we tested wanted to determine if this higher inhibitor receptor expression meant that the gamma delta T cells were actually functionally impaired, were they exhausted or not. And we sorted all the gamma delta T cells from the blood samples, added them to small culture wells, and then after 20 hours collected the supernatant and measured 33 different cytokines uh, in the source. And interestingly, we again were very surprised by our gamma delta T cells. So on the x-axis here is the percentage of digit positive cells from this subject sample. And on the y-axis is the average amount of different cytokines secreted per cell in the culture. And for the uninfected controls on the, in the top line or in black, uh, it looked like we would expect, so the more uh, digit positive cells are in the culture, the less uh, cytokines they make. So the exact opposite was found in HIV positive subject with significantly more cytokine produced with more digit positive cells in culture. And the cytokines included soluble CD137, granzyme A, granzyme B, MIP1 beta, MIP3 alpha. Uh, we also saw some strong trends for perforin, TNF alpha, and interferon gamma. So digit here is not an exhaustion marker of gamma delta T cells in the context of uh, our suppressed HIV infection. So their functionality is clearly different in HIV positive and HIV negative subjects. Um, so we can't call these cells exhausted anymore just based on the fact that they express an exhaustion mark. Um, and at this point, we went back from our in vitro system to the patient data, put together our inhibitor receptor signature data with measurement of 16 markers of inflammation and cardiovascular disease in our subject plasma. Because remember, I said that um, there were markers, biomarkers of inflammation in the plasma that track with the um, cardiac events and um, other uh, comorbidities of age in HIV positive patients. So we have collaboration with uh, Laufenberger's lab in uh, MIT. So uh, two postdocs from the lab, Olin Sarchenka and Elizabeth Proctor ran PLSDA, uh, partially squared uh, discriminant analysis uh, on our data set. So with PLSDA, just like with Citrus, you tell the algorithm who is in which subject group. So in our case, we had four groups, healthy, younger, healthy, older, 
HIV younger and HIV older groups. And the goal of this method is to determine if the groups are actually different, and if so, uh, to determine which of the parameters you fed into the model are actually defining the differences in the groups. And here's the result. So PLSDA projects the multidimensional data into a latent variable space, and each subject is color-coded according to their group. So you see healthy younger ones are green, healthy older are blue, health, uh, HIV younger red, and HIV older yellow. Uh, we can see that HIV status tends to separate groups across the latent variable one axis, the horizontal axis, and the age translates into latent variable two axis separation. And all four groups separated pretty well, as you can see, and also, as you can quantify, they are significantly separated. And the reasonable question that we asked ourselves before the reviewers would ask it, right, was what if the plasma data alone would do this separation? So we did the same modeling, but replaced the gamma delta T cells, um, T cell signature with CD8 T cell inhibitor receptor signature. So CD8 cells also express all four inhibitor receptors. Uh, and they were not different by citrus. So when we did this replacement, the model failed to separate the groups. So we were pretty confident to say that gamma delta T cells are integral to this four group different inflammatory states and that HIV younger subjects are clearly separated from healthy older individuals, meaning that HIV infection is not simply aging your immune system. So when we have aging and HIV infection collide, that creates a completely new inflammatory network and process. Gamma delta T cells are likely a component of this divergent inflammatory process, aging without and with HIV. So the bottom line is HIV does not simply induce early aging. So the take home messages from this study is that we use citrus to analyze um, inhibitor receptor signatures on different subsets, and we revealed that TIGIT on gamma delta T cells exclusively defines avaremic HIV positive subjects from controls, therefore may be an effective biomarker or therapeutic target. TIGIT on gamma delta T cells is associated with HIV, uh, with activation of, uh, um, of the cells in HIV positive subjects and not with exhaustion. So you can't use inhibitor receptor expression as a universal correlate of immune exhaustion. And finally, with our modeling, uh, we revealed divergent aging process with and without HIV, and likely gamma delta T cells are a component in this inflammation process. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, Dr. Jennifer Snyder Capone, here with whom we run this project, Nina Lin, our clinical co collaborator, our MIT collaborators, and uh, of course, our cytobank collaborators, so Kat Draker uh, and Chris Sicolella, who are now um, who left cytobank recently and then also uh, Jeff Cracker, who is still with Cytobank. They all helped us a lot with uh, forming and completing this project, and we're looking forward for further collaboration. And of course, I, I always thank Isaac for the support of my research. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for the great talk. Um, let me uh, transfer back to my screen now. Um, so we, we're going to start with the QA session, but just to summary that, you know, if you are new to Cytobank, uh, please sign up for our 30-day trial on the premium. And you can also take advantage of our training and consulting uh, services. We are happy to provide any uh, consultation on your project. We also have great educational uh, resource. As Anna mentioned earlier, we had a CITRUS uh, YouTube uh, video that uh, shows, you know, explain all the models in more detail uh, in, on our YouTube video. And also, we just recently released a Flowsome blog blog post by our scientific team. You're welcome to check them out. Uh, we have very strong support and help portal. We can provide live troubleshooting on your experiment uh, within your account. So, yeah, just get in touch and let us know if you have any questions. Uh, now, going to start with our uh, QA now, I see uh, the first question coming. It says, so in order to overlap such a uh, cluster on visiting analysis, how is the workflow? Uh, first visiting and then run stitches. Uh, yeah, this seemed to be for Cytobank. I will be happy to take that question. So yeah, there's a, a few extra steps if you are trying to overlay your stitches, identify the stitches cluster on your uh, visiting plot. First, you will need to run 
uh, visiting first on your CHS data, on the data you're trying to run, you know, finding the um, different biomarker. So run VSNI first, um, then you can run stitches on the VSNI channel you use for the clustering. Um, and then as normally, as a normal flow, once the clusters are identified, there's a few extra steps. You need you know, concatenate the files and then upload them back to the original file. Um, so yeah, if you need to know the, you know, the, if you have any question during your um, actual data analysis, you can uh, write in to our support at cyberbank.org. I'll be happy to provide step-by-step -step, uh, instruction that way. Uh, I hope that answers your question. And let's see if there's um, any more uh, question coming. Uh, okay, actually, I, Anna, I'm going to ask a question uh, on behalf of a lot of users here. Uh, I know a few, a lot of people are interested in, you know, uh, as you have already published the, the paper, uh, if the data associated with the publication is available to the public access, and if so, where can they access the data if they want to try out stitches on themselves? Uh, so, sure. So I have this data are all loaded inside a bank. Um, I am happy to share the experiments with you if you just uh, look me up and sh send me an email and tell me what your handle is inside a bank. I'm happy to share the experiment uh, that contains our data. Oh, that, that would be great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so for Cytobank, we uh, had, do have the option to uh, make the experiment public if you wish so. So we also have some public data that you can test on CHS on. So just sign up with the, our premium. You will be able to access the CHS data set, demo data set we have now, and you can try out all the functionality yourself. Uh, let's see, I do have uh, another question here from the attendee says, you know, how to decide the number of clusters when running stitches? Is there any approach that could be indicative or do we need to test different values and check which one shows um, better results? Um, sure. So uh, you do not directly uh, tell Citrus to say the number of clusters. It's, it's not the same as, for example, for Spade, where actually you give it a number. Uh, so in Citrus, instead, you set up the percentage of population to be uh, clustered into the smallest cluster. So your smallest cluster will have at least that percentage of your total population. And that number should come from some educated guess. So uh, if you know the... Uh, if you know the heterogeneity of your population and you have some general understanding of what it would be, uh, you can certainly use that as an initial number. Uh, you can also test different values and see the results that you're getting. Uh, in our case, for example, we have a big population of CD4 and CD8 cells, but we really do not expect to see a lot of subsetting of those uh, populations with the markers that we have in the panel. So uh, we tend to overcluster them in, in the runs where we have uh, aiming, we're aiming for the smaller subsets. So this is often the question that you need to answer in different ways to assess uh, comparisons in different populations. Yeah, exactly. Thank you uh, for that, uh, to answer that question. Uh, so actually in Bank, when you set up Citrus, you're able to you know, identify the smallest cluster you're going to define. So you could uh, set up a few, um, then you can run them simultaneously and check on the results that way too. Um, so I do have another question for Dr. Belkina here. So he asked that in your workflow after compensation and before getting into the steps using Cytobank, you have the quality assessment step. What are some of the QAs that you do? Do you have a checklist of these? Um, so some of those steps are basically outlined with all our procedures with uh, general generation of flow cytometry data, and they include the quality assessment of the instrument. So we usually review that all before we do any analysis of the data. We also look for batch uh, artifacts uh, using uh, some analysis templates that we mostly do in Flojo. There are also several scripts that would automatically scan for uh, irregularities in your uh, cytometry data. 
So uh, we use several R packages for that uh, and also some Flojo plugins. So there's uh, so the scripts, some of the scripts would be Flow Clean. There's also Flow AI. So we usually run a batch of them and um, use some kind of a compendium of those to, uh, to make decisions whether some of the samples should be excluded or some artifacts should be cut out of the recording. I mean, the this, this samples are often pretty large, so we have hundreds of thousands of events and we can afford excluding some if there's some irregularity with the recording. So that's just part of the normal QC procedure. Uh, we also sometimes, uh, the artifacts become more clear when you actually do algorithmic analysis. So if you have some batch effect, you will see, for example, that some of your samples tend to cluster into specific uh, parts of the tree in, um, in your citrus run. So that would clearly indicate that you have batch to batch variability. Great. Um... We do have another question for Cytobank. Uh, he said, I'm a new grad student and the only person in the lab doing high dimensional flow. Does Cytobank have education promotion for individual students? Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for asking that. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, we offer a lot of education resources. We have the Cytobank YouTube channel with all the past webinars and also basic training videos. Uh, if you are interested in get a uh, you know, personal touch, just write in to us and uh, we will be happy to set up a demo for you. Uh, that way to get you started. Uh, but otherwise, you know, we have great online resource and education with our support articles, also a great way to get started. Um, let's see, here's another question. Uh, it says, what was the phenotype of the gamma delta T cells between the HIV and normal patients, young and old? That's for you, Dr. Belkina. Um, so yeah, I think I, I answered that privately. <laughs> so we're actually <laughs> investigating this right now. This We're working on a new study where we have a larger panel that uh, characterizes gamma delta T cells in more detail. So I can say that these phenotypes are very diverse. So we see not a single population of gamma delta T cells, but at least five or six different subsets. So uh, that we couldn't really characterize in detail enough in this study. So we endeavored another study that we're working on right now. Got it. Um... Yeah, so uh, another question that I would like to ask is that, you know, uh, once you have the citrus, I think one of the slides you share, you know, both Sam and Pam, and definitely Sam found a lot more significant clusters as it is intent to do because it's finding all the significant clusters. So I want to see, you know, uh, have you uh, follow up on the, um, the, significant difference that was identified Sam, but not the PAM. Uh, did you do any manual verification or any other models to identify you know, if they are you know, significant or? Yes, and also there is another question that asked like how we detect artifact clusters that kind of relates to the same thing, right? So yeah, we never trust one method and it's not that we discriminate citrus for some reason, like we never trust one method when we do any data mining, right? So uh, Citrus uses hierarchical clustering, which sometimes has its own drawbacks in terms of the cleanness of the clustering. So uh, we would always do some alternative tool and uh, we use Flowsum a lot, for example, and uh, we used to use Spade more um, before. And then we basically want to verify that the same population can be either gated manually or clustered by other methods and uh, we can actually find the cells uh, with, uh, to be sure that we're actually seeing something real. So that would be one thing. And then uh, we would investigate if the cells cluster uh, with multiple cl algorithms, we would actually investigate what the phenotype is. And most likely it would be that the SAM picked it up because of the threshold being slightly different, but actually if there is a biologically plausible explanation for the difference, then most likely it will be picked up by other methods as well. If it's more like artificial thing that we only find in citrus, we would consider this basically a, our overmining and we would not take this into account in the future runs. So we never 
just rely on one method. Got it. Um, I do have another, probably that will be our last question due to the time. Uh, so I have a question asking, is there a minimum number of events per sample that a, a citrus analysis can be performed? Example, minimum 100 events per sample in a group of 20 individuals. Um, Anna, do you have any uh, insight on that or otherwise I can take that one? Well, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how it's implemented inside a bank. So I know that technically you can go, uh, I think, very low. Practically, uh, you come into the question, if your cluster has only like five cells, is it something meaningful that you're looking at or, or completely not? I think the cutoff is 50 cells per cluster in, in the implementation of Citrus that I used last time. And uh, that's kind of what we tend up when we looked at the INKT cells, that's probably the cutoff that we said, because those cells are very rare. Um, yeah, so uh, actually that's exactly uh, with Citrus Run. Uh, for the set bank setup, uh, you can you know go very low, or you can put in uh, the equal sampling. We can go very low, however, as Anna said, you know, it need to be biological, uh, making biological sense. If you only have, you only input 100 events per sample, then uh, it probably doesn't, uh, the significant finding probably doesn't, you know, make any biological sense. So it really depends on your uh, experiment setup. If you are using, you know, other genomic data other than cytometry data, probably you could go very low to run the uh, situs. So yeah, we can discuss that more if you are um, have further questions in regard to this, just write to us to support at cytobank.org. We'll be happy to uh, take that discussion from there. Um, but otherwise, well, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for uh, attending the webinar today. It was a great uh, one and hopefully you learned a lot about Citrus or maybe you have more questions about Citrus. So welcome to send any question to us or to Dr. Burkina. Uh, I think she has her email address in the slide over there. Um, so Dr. Belkina, thank you so much for your time and effort to put in such a awesome presentation. Um, so thank you. Thank you all.